right, we're going to get started. Thanks, everyone, for being patient. We wanted to give everyone a little bit extra time today to straggle in. So, welcome to Affiliate Summit East 2012. Yay, come on, there you go. All right. My name is Daniel M. Clark. I'm a podcaster at QAQN.com, and I have the honor and privilege of being your MC for this event. And I'm going to be real quick here because we want to bring up our keynote, and I have a few announcements to make, and, uh, and then we'll get to that. So, free Wi-Fi in the keynotes, the breakout sessions, and the dining and networking areas. The ID is Affiliate Summit, and the password is ASE12 Wi-Fi. Now, that's printed on the back of your uh, badges, so, and it is case sensitive. Follow ASE12 on Twitter and Affiliate Summit, at Affiliate Summit on Twitter for news, promos, and networking. Enter the uh, Vegas Baby competition for a chance to win a VIP pass to Affiliate Summit West 2013 in Las Vegas, which is coming up in uh, not 2012, but 2013, January 13th to the 15th at Caesars in Las Vegas. I didn't make the slides. Registration is open now. We need your feedback. If you haven't downloaded the uh, uh, Event Method app yet, it's available on Android and iPhone, it's fantastic, I'm a big fan. You can leave feedback for all your sessions, you can get your uh, schedules, find out about speakers. It's just like those pages that you have in the Feedfront magazine that tell you the agenda, it's fantastic. Have you joined the Affiliate Summit Forum? Network, learn and have fun at forum.affiliatesummit.com. It's great, it's 24-7, lots of people there, lots of great conversations, lots of education. What are you doing tonight? Affiliate ball is happening at 9.30 until whenever. They don't know. It could go all night. More info at affiliateball.com. And uh, if that's not your speed, we have affiliate karaoke from 9 until midnight in the Nassau suite here in the hotel. Always a great time. You can't go wrong with karaoke. It's hysterical. <laughs> 4,279 attendees. This is the largest affiliate summit east to date. Round of applause. That's fantastic. It grows year after year, show after show. It grows, and, and this industry is just wonderful. And that's it. That's all I got. So I'm going to introduce our keynote, Sarah Levinson. I got my cheat sheet right here. All right. Now we're on to the keynote speaker. Sarah Levinson has such an extensive bio that we would be here until lunch if I tried to get through it all. I'm going to hit the highlights. Ms. Levinson has forged a distinguished career working with some of the world's leading brands. Her board experience includes such world-renowned brands as Macy's and Harley-Davidson, as well as a number of internet startups. She's a board member of Cafe Mom, the popular social network for mothers, where she previously served as chairman and CEO. She was the president of NFL Properties, Inc., the licensing, marketing, and sponsorship division of the NFL. And she represents all the teams. And while there, she introduced fan development programs to expand the NFL's fan base, aiming to bring in women and casual fans nationally. And under her leadership, Advertising Age named the NFL the Promotional Marketer of the Year, recognizing the NFL's promotional efforts with women and, uh, and kids. Uh, Ms. Levinson was named the first Woman of the Year by Women in Sports and Entertainment. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy, so this next bit is the really cool part for me. She was the president of MTV, Music Television. She's held the executive vice president roles at uh, MTV Networks, Nickelodeon, and VH1. And during her tenure at MTV, Ms. Levinson directed the network's global expansion with the launches of, get this, MTV Brazil, MTV Asia, over two dozen countries, that one, MTV Japan, and MTV Latino, which served the entire continent of South and Central America. She also served on the board of MTV Europe and the Comedy Channel, which you may know as the predecessor of Comedy Central. Sarah Levinson has had an extraordinary career working in publishing, advertising, marketing, and entertainment. She's a graduate of both Cornell and Columbia Universities. Please give a warm welcome to Sarah Levinson.
Good morning. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. It kind of makes me feel very old when I hear all those things. When Sean Collins asked me to speak to the Affiliate Summit this morning, he said it might be useful for me to spend a little time talking about my career, that path and the experiences I had working on some of those very iconic global brands. So I told my 20-year-old son, who tries to keep me a little more current than I am, that I was going to talk about the past, and he made a face. And I realized that his interpretation of my job and my career was kind of thinking about the fact that cell phones weighed barbells, as heavy as barbells, and uh, you could actually smoke on airplanes. Clark Kent went into the proverbial phone booth when he needed to change into Superman. But it's true that in the modest, modestly distant past, I spent about eight years at MTV when it was true, rock music got your money for nothing and chicks for free. And I was the first female executive at the National Football League, or any professional sport league for that matter, at a time when the NFL thought that marketing was a three-hour game on national television. Much has changed since then, but the fundamental truths still apply. For those of us in this room who work in businesses that require customers, which I'm assuming is everybody in this room, the bottom line truth is, we don't really work for our employers, we work for the customers. It's not the brands or the businesses that send you checks, it's the customers. Our salaries paid for by the customer. And I think you guys know better than most. You show me the customer, I'll show you the money. When I started at MTV, if I'd had an iPod in those days, most of the music we featured would never have made it to my playlist. But you didn't need to love the music to know that if we focused on what mattered to the audience, instead of things like social security, that would have been health insurance, education, and AIDS, we could launch a voter registration and get out the vote campaign. And that campaign could make history, which is how, in 1992, 18-year-olds voted in greater numbers than they had in 20 years since they were first given the right to vote. When I started at the National Football League, Aside from the occasional Super Bowl TV viewing party, I had never really watched a professional football game. Seriously. I didn't tell that to them when they were hiring me, but it's true. I couldn't have told you if Joe Namath worked for the Giants or for the Jets. But I soon knew enough about the customer to get us into flag football leagues for kids, and we ran television ads during games showing women as fans to soften the NFL's macho image. What happens when you don't know the customer? Well, let me tell you one story from 1980, when CNN launched. Back then, a lot of people thought the only value of cable TV was the copper and the wires. Still, as soon as it started to look like CNN might be onto something, an imitator was inevitable. That imitator came from a joint venture of Westinghouse and ABC News. They took the idea of CNN and upped the ante. Here's how. CNN was a 24-hour news channel, but it wasn't a 24-hour live news channel. ABC and, Westing and Westinghouse would be the first to go there, launching a new cable channel called Satellite News Channel, SNC. CNN broadcast often what was rehashed news. They would rebroadcast from earlier in the day. But do you think the viewers cared? Not in the least. In fact, they didn't even realize that they weren't watching a live news broadcast. A little research could have better informed those in charge. But in their hubris, ABC and Westinghouse never asked the consumer anything about their likes, their attitudes, their perceptions. Why would they bother? The cable executives there were news executives and news junkies. They thought themselves were the heavy consumers, so they knew. And so they committed millions and millions of dollars to a proposition that consumers just didn't care about. And they delivered the news 24 hours a day, live. As a result, when the Russians announced at 2 o'clock in the wee hours of the night that Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev had died, the ABC Westinghouse Cable Channel was the first to break the news, and they had the story exclusively for at least a couple hours. 
Unfortunately, at 2 a.m., the big moment when we could deliver proof of concept, no one was watching. Sooner than you might have thought, the network was shut down. It seems so obvious. Learn everything you can about the customer, then focus on the customer. It's stunning how often businesses will tell you that's what they're doing when they're doing anything but. Because people often say one thing and do another, here's one more thing I recommend. Hang on to your sense of humor. It's often the case that people who don't communicate well go into media and public relations. We frequently see that people who have difficulty relating to others go into management. And it's mathematically guaranteed, no matter what you do, that at least one of the people you work with will be certifiably insane. And not just that, he or she will be completely committed to drive you as crazy as well. To try to see your work, so just try to see your work environment as a comedy and you'll do much better. A career is built on a foundation of ideas, caring about your customer, looking for new opportunities, enjoying your daily comedy show. If I had a recipe for success, that's it. Also, a career is built on your biography, on who you are and where you came from, and who influenced you along the way. In my case, my perspective came from my family, which gave me the confidence to take an unusual career path. I grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia, when there were still people who didn't know that the Civil War had ended and that the South had actually lost. There were five kids in my family, and all of them went to college, which meant my father had two jobs. One, he was a chemist, a real scientist by day, and at night and weekends, he actually sold insurance. My mother was a feminist before there was a name for it. She was a teacher, and she so strongly believed in educating women for important jobs that she refused to pay for any college courses I could take that would have prepared me for a traditional job. In the summer, when I was 17, I decided to study French at the Hampton Institute, historically an all-black college in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Of course, I knew who went there, but I had a friend, also white, who was applying with me. We were going to go together, and there were scholarships, and I figured the students would be a cross-section from around the country, and hey, it was French. I had big plans for that summer. I was gonna have some major fun. But just before the summer session started, my friend's parents, who were a little more racist than I ever could have understood, told them that he ref they refused to let him go to the school. And as my parents drove me onto campus, there wasn't a single white face in sight. And my very reasonable, enlightened father, as he was driving, said, you know, you don't have to do this. And then my very reasonable, enlightened mother said, by the way, she was the only white teacher in an all-black school. She said, Sarah, this is going to be a marvelous experience. The summer of 1967 never happened for many of you, I guess, so let me give you a little snapshot. It was an amazingly tense time in our country, and race was a big factor. That summer, there was a riot in the Detroit ghetto that left 43 dead, 467 injured, and 2,000 buildings destroyed. That summer, 30 armed members of the Black Panthers entered the California legislature to shout out their right to carry weapons. That summer, 800 body bags were coming back from Vietnam each month, most of them soldiers of color. So, not only was I going to experience what it was like to be in a minority, there was a good chance I was going to experience what it was like to be whitey. But in fact, I had an enlightening experience that summer at Hampton, and as I look back, connecting the dots from my summer at Hampton Institute in Virginia to this podium today, it's completely clear to me I wouldn't be here if I hadn't gone there. It was at Hampton that I learned never to be afraid to leap into the unknown. I went on to major in human development at Cornell, where, among other topics, I studied black leadership. Not a foundation for a career, but in 1972, what was? We were still reeling from Vietnam, and the National Guard killed, killing four students at Kent State, and the strikes that closed down 500 college campuses. Unlike many of my friends, I didn't want to get married on the day I graduated from college, and I didn't hope to get pregnant on my wedding night. I had other dreams, challenging work, travel, a big life. I had no plan. 
But I spent the summer before my senior year trekking around Europe, and I wanted desperately to return and live there. So I got a job in the English countryside as a governess. That job didn't last long. By August, my mother came over and said, you have to quit this job. We're going, we're traveling. We're, we're just going to, I only have a month left before school starts and you're coming with me. So we bummed around Britain and Scotland, got a URL pass, and we had absolutely no itinerary. You starting to see a theme here? We just get on trains and go where they were going. One night, we decided to visit the alleged home of the Loch Ness Monster. We got off the train after dark. Where were we? We were in the historic town with tons of hotels, but absolutely no vacancies, not a single one. The only reason we eventually found a bed and breakfast was a very kind policeman who felt incredibly sorry for us, who drove us around in his police car until we find someone nice enough to take us in. It was at that point that my mother imposed the only rule of the trip, get off the train before the sun goes down. So you see, I had a lot of encouragement to take a chance, to embrace serendipity, to just go. When I returned to America, it was time to get serious, to start a career in earnest, or at least to get a real job. I had a chance at that point to do some research with a professor in North Carolina, but he was murdered. It was a big shock. Color me confused and a bit lost, and with no job, very short of serendipity. My college roommate was in New York. She had a job, and she had an apartment. Sounded good. I went to New York. The only job I could find was secretary, and it probably was an easy job to get because I wasn't really very good at typing. It was at this point that I decided, I think I'll go get an MBA from business school. It was for a very simple reason. Every time I applied for a job, I was asked, how fast can you type? In case you ever wondered if those feminists in the 70s were justified in screaming about unequal opportunity and glass ceilings, consider this. When I finally did get my MBA, I was asked the question still. Glad to see you have an MBA. Now, how fast can you type? This was depressing. I started to feel lost. But then I was offered a job at Doyle Dane Birnbeck in advertising and everything started to change. Why did I get that job? Because it was the only job I could get. It turned out I was good at advertising. I was promoted, and then I was promoted again. I was on the fast track, destined for yet another promotion. But I decided to bail, it got boring, and I left to work at Showtime Entertainment. Now, why would anyone leave advertising to go to Showtime in the late 70s? Nobody had even heard of the place by then. I can't say that I had a vision of the future of cable or much confidence that Showtime did either. When I arrived, we were delivering the programming to cable operators, not by satellite, but on VHS cassettes. Every month, we'd pack up a bag of 14 movies and send it to the cable operator. But we had what was then a very, very strong selling proposition. Picture this. The movies were unedited, they were uncut, and they were uninterrupted. Why take that job? The chance to work with a very imaginative mentor. But he soon left, and I soon left. Eventually, I got to MTV. Was there ever a hotter brand? Video killed the radio stars, how the song put it, and MTV owned rock video. It was not just the leading network for rock videos. It was growing fast. If I'd ever fallen into a dish of cream, this was it. Only guess what? It wasn't. MTV was growing, but when you started pulling those numbers apart, you saw the growth was closely linked to the growth of cable itself. We were just getting more distribution, so it masked what was really going on. We were huge among the 15 to 18-year-olds, but the problem was an equally important target audience that we weren't getting and we were actually losing. Young adults in the 22 to 24-year-old set. MTV had pretty soft ratings. Looking deeper, you saw that we needed to reinvent the network. We had reached the end of the big arena stars, performers like Michael Jackson and Madonna and Bruce Springsteen. There was new music coming up. It was grunge, it was rap, it was hip hop, the hair bands, the headbangers, and a lot of it was very exciting. But a lot more of it was polarizing and controversial. Remember Tipper Gore and her campaign to put ratings on music? Remember how much some religious groups were offended by the likes of Kurt Cobain? Well, I remember, 
because I was personally letter bombed by the Christian Coalition for airing Nirvana's videos. We were still doing great with the world's most fickle audience, the teenagers. That was unprecedented. We owned a generation. Advertisers produced commercials just to air on MTV. Fashion followed us, and filmmakers were schooled on our techniques. So why weren't the 24-year-olds tuning in? Well, research told us they had longer attention spans, they were tired of those three-minute videos, and there was no real sense of urgency for them to tune in and see the latest one. So we've decided to create long-form programming, animated shows like Beavis and Butthead, and reality programming like The Real World, and game shows like Remote Control, and dance shows with downtown Julie Brown, House of Style with Cindy Crawford. Anybody remember any of these? We program, <laughs> we program music in half-hour blocks by genre, like Yo! MTV Raps and Headbangers Ball. We changed music from an endless loop to appointment viewing. Did we make mistakes? You bet. But when we did, it was because we shortchanged the customer. I'm thinking of Neil Young in the video, This Note's For You. It was a brutal attack on commercialism that included a Michael Jackson look-alike whose hair caught on fire. The advertising sales department was completely freaked out at the thought that we would play this video. They were understandably concerned, thinking that we would lose advertisers. But what we should have really been nervous about is alienating the viewers by not playing the video. But unfortunately, we listened to the ad sales guys and didn't. Naturally, Neil's video became a monster hit, and we backpedaled like crazy. We eventually played it, played it a lot, and that year, the video won MTV Award for Best. The best thing about MTV was that whatever happened was never to be repeated. If we had a motto, we called ourselves the channel of the moment. Everything we did was for now. Next time, we'd do it differently. That's why after every award show, we'd have what we called a post-mortem meeting. We'd ask, what can we do better? How can we surprise the audience? And we did. One year, Pee Wee Herman was in hiding because of an incident in a porno movie theater. Well, MTV got him to come out of hiding and open the award show. Post-mortem meeting. What do you do for an encore? What do you do to top that? Michael Jackson kissing Lisa Marie Presley. How do you top that? Madonna kissing Britney Spears, and on and on. Sometimes we created surprises. Sometimes they just rolled our way. Like the launch of MTV Europe. We had Terrence Trent Darby, and Elton John performing in a private club. It was in Amsterdam. It was so much fun. It was a measure of that moment that Elton was actually the opening act. Great show, great party, and even better after party to come. We saw Terrence Trent Darby in the hotel lobby. We said, oh, you have to come up to our private party. So he said, definitely, turned around and invited his posse, a dozen Hells Angels from Holland. They followed him up the elevator to the private suite grabbing and swigging bottles from, of liquor, just straight out of the bottle. It wasn't hard to figure out where that party was going. It was the first time I can say I actually called up security and pretended to be alarmed that there was a party that was about to go bust, and I asked them to please send up their biggest guy and bust up the party. Launching MTV around the, around the globe was usually a lot of fun, but then there was the day in Vietnam when we had just enough free time to hire a boat up the Saigon River. It was immensely pleasant. It was a perfect day. Somebody had a camera, memorialized the moment. On a nearby boat, Japanese men floated by, playing cards, shirts off, made a fabulous picture. Click. Within seconds, these men were swarming our boat. They were police, and you just don't take pictures of police in Vietnam. It's clearly stated in every single guidebook if we'd bothered to pay attention. We were towed to shore, hauled into a Quonset hut, and interrogated. They demanded our passports. We knew, obviously, no Vietnamese. Nothing we mimed made any difference. Luckily, one of us had a book of Vietnamese phrases. Slowly and painfully, the fearless leader among us said in Vietnamese, my name is Tom and I am sorry. I'm not really sure what he actually said, but it was enough to make them laugh and let us go. We got ourselves out of trouble that time. Let me tell you the story about a glass ceiling. Not an MTV, because when I was there, Tom Freston appointed women to run MTV and Nickelodeon. 
That was kind of astonishing in American broadcasting at the time. This story takes place in Tokyo, when Freston had me negotiate the deal for MTV Japan. Now, if you've ever sat at a negotiating table with Japanese, you know that the seating plan of a meeting is seeing the chart of hierarchy. Whoever's sitting at the center, across from the Japanese person from the company that you're talking to, is sitting opposite you, center table, sent to center table. And if you're unlucky enough to sit at the end of the table, you know you're really, it, the head of the table there is not where you want to be. Nowhere to be found a woman. And yet, here I was, the highest ranking MTV executive and a woman. No way the Japanese could process this. They stalled the meeting as long as they possibly could, asking very vague questions like, how is Mr. Freston-san? I said, he's fine. They kept asking very vague questions, but I knew what they really wanted to know. Where is he? When will he be here? But I played it out with a few non-answers. I had a little of my own fun. It was my sense of humor without them knowing it. When I thought I'd tortured them enough, I finally said, Mr. Freston is, is not in Tokyo. I represent MTV in Japan. Well, much embarrassment followed. They made me get up from the seat at the end of the table and sit in the middle seat. And to their amazement, and mine too, I guess, we actually did some business. Last month, you saw that Melissa Meyer became CEO of Google and that she's six months pregnant, pregnant having a baby this fall. When I heard that, I thought, how much things really have changed. Because when I became president of MTV, I was a month pregnant. But I kept it a big secret, or so I thought. I was out to here, five months pregnant, finally got up the nerve to ask my boss to have dinner with me so I could break the news to him. He said, I know what you're going to tell me. I said, how? he said, I've known for months. It's fine, it's fine. But it really wasn't. A year later, my boss confessed. If I'd known you were pregnant, he said, I never would have promoted you. I said, why not? He replied, I didn't think it was fair to you. That also sounded like the right thing to say, and again, it wasn't really true. I'll translate it for you. What he probably meant was, there's no way a mom, much less a pregnant woman, fit brand MTV. And so yes, things really have changed. The National Football League, exact opposite. I went from how can you shake this up to that is not the way we do things here. If I heard that once, I heard it a million times. That's because the NFL was the ultimate boys club when I started there in 1994. The boys were crotchety and they were set in their ways. The NFL hadn't done a single piece of research. They didn't really need to. A national study confirmed what everyone already believed in their heart and in their gut. The NFL is the most popular spectator sport in America. Today, the NFL is a genius marketing machine. In 1994, they had no marketing department. They explained to me why and advised, don't talk about the NFL as a brand, I was told. We're not toothpaste. We are the league. Hmm. But I knew we needed a marketing department complete with a market research department and a fan development department. Those were the days when Michael Jordan was on the basketball court and it really seemed kind of obvious that if we didn't get into the hearts and minds of the next generation of fans 20 years from now, they would not be the most popular spectator sport. But no one internally believed that. So I plunged ahead and started. Who was the NFL customer, I thought? Now remember, I didn't really know a whole lot about NFL football or why people became customers. But the old guard knew. He was a guy who watched three hours of, three games rather, on a Sunday and then tuned in for one more on Monday night. And how did they know? Because they watched three games on a Sunday and a fourth on Monday night. It just didn't compute for me though. I remember growing up in Portsmouth, Virginia, where we had no professional football team. And yet, when a relative died, a New Yorker, a Giants fan, in his coffin they placed a Giants flag. I wondered, why do people become avid fans? Or in this case, a diehard fan. And when my doorman learned I worked at the NFL, he pulled me aside and said, I just can't even believe that the Jets just drafted 
whoever it was at the time. This was in April. I couldn't even believe he was caring who was going to be on the team. The season was months away. Why did he care? So I asked questions. I started getting some really interesting answers. I learned that football is the great equalizer, that 1% loves it, and so do the rest of us. And here was my greatest discovery. 40% of NFL fans are women. They were shocked to find this out. What did I do with that knowledge? I dug deeper and deeper into the consumer understanding. And I saw that the values that drove the brand of NFL and football were community, heritage, power, a sense of ownership, it's my team, and Americana. And I used those findings to make an end run around the boys. 1999, we got the NFL involved in the Susan Komen race for the cure. And NFL started to speak to the fans of tomorrow, the 8 to 11 year olds, the absolute sweet spot when fans actually become fans. We had players make commercials thanking the fans, and we opened up competition for punt, pass, and kick to girls. Just a few months after I started, I won that first award for women in sports. I actually can tell you honestly, I didn't deserve it. I got it, I really think, because a woman, any woman at the NFL was big news. On Madison Avenue, the most important thing we did was market the NFL. Ad Age named us the sports, it was the first time a sports league had won promotional market of the year. We were on USA Today's front page, nightly news. They were talking about our marketing campaign to women and kids. It was really successful and really fantastic. But inside the NFL, the old guard hated every single thing the new marketing team did. It got so bad that Commissioner Tagliabue called an internal meeting. He had only one item on the agenda. As he put it, how do we put an end to the interscene fratricidal warfare? Nothing got resolved, so he brought in a relationship expert. The relationship expert went around the room asking everyone, who do you work for? Who do you work for? And he got some answers that are not surprising. Most people said they work for their supervisor. Some said they worked for Commissioner Tagliabue, and many answered that they worked for the team owners. I was the only one in that room who said, I work for the fans. As unpopular as it sounded, that may remain my mantra. As much as it was hard for my colleagues to, bring the NF to let me bring NFL into the 20th century, sometimes it wasn't exactly a tailgate party with some of the owners. Two stories I'll give you, will give you the picture. I actually could probably fill a book with them, but I'm just going to give you two. Eddie DeBartolo was the owner of the San Francisco 49ers. He was really the first to try to strong arm me. We had a meeting. It was in an empty ballroom, not unlike this, with tables. No one was in the room except for me and the consultant that I brought along with me who was working on the business, Mr. DeBartolo, and two very large guys who had to be his bodyguard. I introduced the consultant to Mr. DeBartolo. I'd like you to meet Dr. Michael Rubin. Dr. Rubin, he said. Dr. Rubin, what is he, a proctologist? Without missing a beat, I just said, no, but he sure knows an asshole when he sees one. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't the only one with a sense of humor in that room. The bodyguards laughed, and Eddie laughed, and I was allowed to live another day. Then there's Jerry Jones, the owner of the Super Bowl winning Dallas Cowboys. You remember them, the America's team? What you have to understand about the NFL is that the marketing model is socialism. It's been that way for decades. Equal revenue from the broadcasting revenue, the marketing revenue, the sponsorship revenue, regardless of market size. That was the basic agreement. Thanks to that agreement, on any given Sunday, a small market team could even beat a huge, a huge franchise like New York. Jerry Jones knew that 25% of NFL branded merchandise had the, had the Cowboys logo on it. So for every dollar spent in the market on NFL t-shirts or whatever it was, 25% of them were for Dallas Cowboys merchandise. Back then, he was winning Super Bowls. So the way he saw it, his boys were entitled to 25% of NFL merchandise cash on the barrel head. He didn't want the 1 30th that we were sending him every year for his equal share. Compromise was just not possible. 
The league ended up having to sue Jerry. Jerry countersued. And unfortunately, that was the first time I got to be named in a lawsuit. It tested my sense of humor and kind of sucked the fun out of the job. I'd been at the NFL for seven years, accomplished a boatload, but realized that that was about as good as it was going to get, and I wasn't going to be changing too much more going forward. Besides, the internet beckoned, so I left. These days, I'm on the board of social networking internet company, Cafe Mom, lots of fun. Flow.net, a real-time data sharing startup. I'm on the advisory board of a new startup called Viewbix. I think some of the founders are here. And I'm on the board of those two Fortune 500 companies, Macy's and Harley-Davidson. Four years ago, I went with my family to Milwaukee, where the Harleys are built, to participate in the 105th anniversary of Harley. Every five years is a huge celebration. If you guys are near Milwaukee in August of 2013, we're going to have the 110th anniversary celebration. You're welcome to come. Harley is it's the most amazing spectacle. On the street, zillions of Harleys. On the sidewalk, cheering crowds. Parade goes down nine miles of highway that's roped off, and it's nine miles of cheering crowd. I sat on the back of the Harley Road King Classic, and like the other riders and passengers, I held out my hand and cruised slowly through the streets, high-fiving and slapping nine miles of customers. All those people on the streets of Milwaukee, that says something about the power and the reach of this brand. So do the four million people who like Harley Davidson on Facebook and the 80,000 who follow them on Twitter. And Harley has a very sophisticated marketing campaign created to appeal to every demo for new riders, including women, Latinos, young adults, and African Americans. This multi-directional marketing is now the norm. It's not just me saying it. Everyone wants to reach the customer wherever she is, no matter what device she's using. Look at Macy's. Used to be the Thanksgiving parade, Santa Claus, the Fourth of July fireworks, movies like Miracle on 34th Street and the White Sale. Now it's TV shows that find the newest fashion talent, and it's Macy's.com and TV commercials with big name celebrities. I see all those tools and the new technologies, and I think back to those tools that we had when I was at MTV and the NFL. And I think, I'm jealous of the arsenal that you have to play with. I read recently that Lay's Potato Chips is using Facebook instead of focus groups to find out about regional preferences on the flavors for different brands and what the regional preferences might be. And I thought about how many Hershey's Mr. Good bars I had eaten when I was a Doyle Dame Birnbeck, unconsciously sitting behind that two-way mirror while the focus groups were trying to figure out how many peanuts to put into the Mr. Good bar. And then I catch myself. Jealous? Why? The fundamentals still apply. If you have a great brand and understand your customer, you can succeed even in a culture that vaporizes a brand every few minutes. For example, if you think back to when Sports Illustrated was in its heyday, if they'd really understood their customer, there never would have been an opportunity for ESPN to take hold. If Rolling Stone had understood theirs, why would MTV have ever had an opportunity? And AOL, if they'd understood their customer, they should have been Facebook. And even something like Prevention Magazine could have prevented a WebMD. And on and on. It's a world of constant change. And we learn as we learn daily. I'm not criticizing these companies, obviously. There's nothing harder to see than the obvious. And what is the obvious? It's your customer standing right in front of you. I've looked at the customer my entire career, and all I've ever seen is opportunity. And I very much hope that you'll look to your customer and see opportunity too. Thank you. So I am not sure if there's Q&A, but I'm happy to do that if sure. there are questions. I think you probably learned more about me than my own family knew. <laughs> well, I am glad to hear you say that, but uh, 
It's been a major push over the last few years in discovering Harley Davidson as the number one choice of women for the motorcycles, and the push has been pretty significant. They've done amazing work doing tutorials, teaching women how to ride, and actually designing bikes. You'll see in the future, I think, more and more of that, where a woman is going to feel very comfortable on a motorcycle. And that's a definite target audience. I think that the key here is knowing and understanding the customer and listening to those women. And starting to do research for the person who's sitting on the back of the bike. It's like, what do we need to know about that, that person as well? But once, now that you've heard that, I bet you're going to start seeing more and more advertising. It'll click and you'll say, ah, oh, it's not just, just like the NFL. It's not just for the guys. That's right, NASCAR. It's a uh, very communal kind of experience. Yes. Good morning. My name is Joni Ward. I wanted to know if Harley Davidson has an affiliate program, and if so, do I have to go through um, uh, an affiliate network to to apply for um, affiliateship? You know, what I would happily do is take your card and and send it on to the folks in the marketing department. Thank you so much. Yes, exactly. Well, it was always amazing to me to see that because so many of the companies I work for were very strong appeal to a customer like MTV or the NFL where you almost would pay to work there. So you can be deceived or the situation with the news channel where the people who are working there are working there because they have a passion for the product and they see themselves as the customer. And that, that's a pretty slippery slope when you think you are the customer because the customer changes and their attitudes and perceptions change. But I think that you guys are on the, on the front line with the customer. You can see it probably before most because the internet gives you access to see immediate response. So you, you're in a very advantageous position. Yes. Well, um, I don't disagree with you on the way that women think. I think that there's still a huge opportunity going forward. I think there's definitely a push to put more women on corporate boards and more seats at the table in terms of the, the high, the Fortune 500 number of CEOs that are women are put on one hand or two hands. It's disproportionately low. But I think progress is certainly being made when you can be appointed to Yahoo when you're six months pregnant, that is pretty exciting. And I think as more and more women are going into business, the network of bringing in other women, it's, uh, it's very exciting. I, I have to say, I, I never even heard the word glass ceiling until I was too far along to tell you. I, I d didn't really pay too much attention to it, but it was definitely there. Over here. Hi. Um, so you have obviously worked for these very mega-sized brands. What advice would you give to a small business owner who is trying to compete with a mega-sized brand in, in terms of marketing? I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars of spend against somebody who may only have $10,000. What can they do to compete? Well, I think the key is to be very focused and understand exactly who it is your customer is and be rigorous about understanding that customer and and targeting. Don't try to do too much, but sometimes you know you, you have an advantage because you're going to understand your customer much more intimately sometimes than bigger than bigger companies. So one step at a time. 
How do you uh, create value in this economy? In How do you create value in this economy? Yes. How do you see the economy at this point in time compared to all the other times that you've actually done marketing for? Well, I think the economy was pretty terrible in 2000 when I actually joined Club Mom. The internet bubble burst just as I arrived um, in the 80s. There, was, there were problems with the economy. It's, it's a fact of life. It comes and goes. You have good years and not so good years. And you have to stay the course. I mean, if you'd look at a brand like Harley, you would say, well, that is considered to be uh, a, an exp a higher price. Some people would say it's a luxury item. But you, don't, you can't stop. You have to <coughs> deliver fabulous design and new and improved and and be prepared for the time when the economy turns around. I don't think this is a time to take the foot off the pedal. So you really have to dig deeper and continue to market to that customer and deliver what if they, they if you have what they want, they're going to find a way to pay for it. Sarah. Yes. <laughs> um, th thank you. I, I have a takeaway and I have, um, and I have a question for you. You have um, a, what was the first one? A takeaway, a something take that I pulled out of, out of your, um, your conversation. Um, and the, the thought that I took away with was, uh, if, if in the box thinking for us um, is our past, and I kind of think that, I think it is, I think we're all trapped with our own uh, perspective of our businesses. Um, and if our competitors are out of the box, because they always are, and they're looking to take away what's inside the box, um, what one exercise can we do um, in existing business to make sure we're thinking outside of the box and like our competitors might be thinking? And I view that your career, I mean, your education kind of started you out outside of the box and what you bring to every business that I think you've been with is an outside the box perspective. Well, I would say the one big turnoff that I would always hear at companies is the words, that's not the way we do things here. And you would be amazed at how many times I've heard it from incredibly successful brands. And to me, that's like the kiss of death. So having those post-mortem meetings, asking yourself, how do we do it differently? Instructing people that work with you never to say those words, because it's a cultural thing. That's not the way we do things here. Becomes status quo. And rewarding, risk-taking. It's like it's all right to fail. Having people realize it's all right to fail. If you don't have that mentality in your organization and the culture saying that it's all right to fail, people won't take chances. And you have to take chances when you're thinking outside the box. Sometimes not everything works. So I think it's from the very top instilling that sense of Let's try something different. Let's not rest on our laurels, no matter how successful you are. And again, understanding your customer, because your customer is changing out from under you. I think that's it. I hope you guys have a really fabulous session today and enjoy it. I enjoyed speaking with you and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.